Isn't it good to be in God's house today? Amen. Amen. Oh, that was that was good for We do better than that, can't we? Yeah. Aren't you glad to be in God's house today? Yeah. Yeah. All right, now we're on the same page. Let's go to the book of Luke in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here today. We're continuing a sermon series today on friendship and talking about not just human relationships in regard to friendship. We do need to have friendship with one another. But we've also been looking at friendship with God and how a person can be a friend of the Lord. And I told you last week that this week we were going to look at Jesus and who he associated with, who, who he considered friends. And the answer to that may surprise you a little bit. <laughs> this, may be, this sermon may make somebody uncomfortable. It's been making me uncomfortable all week. I'm ready to get it out. So we'll, we'll look at Luke 5, 27. And in just a minute, we're going to turn to Luke 15 and put that on here too. So be ready to do a little turning. But Luke 5, 27, this is the call of Levi, also known as Matthew. And it says, after this, he went out. Now this is talking about Christ here. Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And look what he did. It says, leaving everything, he rose and followed. I mean, just got up from the job site and boogied out of there with Jesus. I mean, this, this is amazing. He left everything, he rose and followed him. And look at what Levi did out of, out of his heart here. It says that he made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples. They, they murmured, they complained, and they said, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. 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 Now, turn over in Luke 15. We're going to spend the bulk of our time over there, but I wanted to show you that this wasn't an isolated incident. <laughs> Jesus being a friend to those who scandalize the, the Pharisees. Luke 15, in verse 1, and you'll notice here there's three parables in the same chapter, all dealing with the same subject matter, and that's going to be a point in the message here in a little while. But you've got the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the prodigal son tonight, but today we're going to talk mainly about these first two. So let's read in Luke 15, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to hear him. How many of you know Jesus draws sinners? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he drew me. It says the tax collectors and sinners, they were all drawing near to him, brethren. They wanted to hear what he had to say. These words of life, they needed to hear the gospel. But again, our dear friends, the Pharisees, or, well, not exactly, <laughs> these villains, yeah. the Pharisees and scribes, were over there grumbling again, see? And they said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Yeah. And if that wasn't enough, he said this. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. Oh, that's some beautiful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I 
let's have a word of prayer before we go any further. Holy Father, we come before you this morning in the sweet name of Jesus. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the spirit that you have placed within us, Lord. And we want to ask today that the Holy Spirit will be our guide in this place. We do not want to quench or grieve you, Lord. So we pray that just now you would guide us into a perfect understanding, Lord, of the principles you are showing us in your word today. Thank you, Father, for considering me a friend. Thank you for drawing sinners to yourself. We love you so very much, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, I think you can see from these passages that there's no two ways about it that Jesus is a friend to sinners. Amen. Jesus is a friend of sinners, and we are very fortunate that that is true. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Because there is not a person in this house who can stand up and say, I've never sinned. I'm so righteous. I don't need Jesus. I don't need forgiveness. We're all in the same boat. So we need to rejoice and be glad this morning that where you find Jesus is around those outcasts, those broken people, the, the sinners, the lost, because that's me and you. But you can just hear those Pharisees, can't you? I mean, if they made a movie of this, I can see it in my mind. You can just hear them over there grumbling now, they didn't grumble to Jesus directly. They grumbled to the disciples, right? They didn't have the guts to go to him, apparently. So they started murmuring to the disciples about what a disgrace it was for Jesus to associate with the low and with the poor and with the broken and with those that society had rejected and forgot. You can just hear them, the nastiness in their words, right? The, the, the venom that they were speaking how they despised anybody who wasn't exactly like them. And they are, they are our example, church, of how not to be. That's a negative report. When they came in there with their words and they said, Oh, Jesus, how could you possibly associate with these scum, with these low lives? How could you do it? And I tell you what that is. That's the spirit of religion. They were so religious, but they didn't have a spiritual bone in their body. See, they, they knew the laws, they knew the rules, they knew the regulation, but they didn't know how to reach out and love and grab a hold of somebody who is broken. But Jesus knows how to do that. And he's going to serve as our perfect and good example this morning as we take a look at how we might be a friend to someone as well. So out of their, those Pharisees, out of their religious thinking, they came against him. And I want to challenge their attitude. I want to challenge them this morning because Pharisees, unfortunately, did not go away. There are still Pharisees today in churches all across this land. I hope you're not one of them. I hope that isn't you because I'm going to challenge you today you know, we don't ever want that attitude, that nastiness to be present in our congregation here at Portland. No. Let it never once be said of us that we said somebody was too lost, too dirty, too sinful, too low, too broken to come into this house and receive Jesus. Amen. Amen. How dare we ever become an exclusive club Come on, church, and start thinking that we are too righteous to associate with anybody who is, quote, unquote, a sinner. Now, look at what Jesus did in verse 2. And, and I, again, I love it that, that, the, that, the, that the lowly people were, were so drawn to Jesus. They were so drawn to him, but those Pharisees and scribes, look what they said. They said, this, this man receives sinners. And there's a song that says that. Christ receiveth sinful men, right? And, and I thought about that word receive, what it means to receive a sinner. Because if Jesus was doing it, I want to do it too. Even if it bothers the Pharisees, you see. I'm going to have to steamroll the Pharisee and the name of love and go on and preach the gospel to the lost. I want to, I want to know what it is to receive a sinner. So I looked up this word in the Greek and and it's interesting, to, to receive someone 
is to give access to oneself. To receive somebody, in other words, is to open yourself to somebody else. That's what it means to so. So if you come to me and, and we're going to be friends, I have to open myself. I have, I have to open my heart and my mind to you and my life, my home to you and receive you. Yes, so when it says they receive sinners, Jesus gives sinners access to himself. And he does, amen? Amen. Every sinner who comes to Jesus in repentance he doesn't turn them away. No, not one, brethren. He's never looked at anybody and said, you can't be saved. You're too far gone. You don't look right. You're not from the right town. You're from an awful family. Never once did he draw those distinctions and lines. He said, I want to give access to myself, to sinners. I want to receive them. And on the cross, brethren, he did. He made access for us all. So not only does it mean to give access to oneself, but it means to accept somebody into your companionship. See, you've got to open your own heart to be a friend to somebody, and then you have to accept them into companionship with you. Now, my question to you this morning, church, is are you willing, like Jesus, are you willing to follow in his shoes today and say, yes, I'm willing to receive a sinner. Yes. I will open my friendship to somebody who needs Jesus even if they don't act right. Even if they don't talk right. Then I'm going to be willing to receive that sinner. And I'm going to accept that person and not reject them and push them away. Will, will you give someone access to you? Will you be open and available to somebody <coughs> If they need to receive Jesus. Can you do it if they dress differently than you? Oh yeah. Can you do it if they're a different color than you? Can you do it if they're male or female? Isn't the gospel for everybody? You see my point. It is not bound by any one terms. Can you open yourself up and say, yes, I will befriend someone in order to shed some light into their life. How about across age lines? Those of you who are older, are you willing to befriend somebody much younger than you to share the gospel with them? How about my young people? Will you associate with the old? Those of us who are washed up. We're too old to cut the mustard, brother. <laughs> oh, man, if y'all missed the banquet last night, you missed the song yeah. of the century. You really did. It was good. But we have to be willing to reach across the lines that society tries to draw between people. You know what I mean? The world wants to divide. Satan wants to divide. We've got to be willing to throw down all of those things that keep us apart from others and say, I'm coming after. I'm coming after the sinner. And I'm going to open myself. I'm going to receive somebody and give access in my life to them. See, when we, when we put people down for anything, it could be what they look like, what they do, we're, pu we're pushing them away from us and potentially pushing them from the church, potentially pushing them from the gospel. God forbid. God forbid anybody try to make a move toward Jesus and we stand in their way. Amen through our stupidity, through our short-sightedness, through our ignorance, that we would not be willing to let someone come to the cross. Jesus gave all sinners access to himself, and he's our example. So we don't want to get that exclusionary, religious type of spirit about us like these Pharisees have. That's something that could keep our church this same size forever. You know, we can enjoy just being a congregation and loving one another. We've made good friends here, and we can just kind of circle the wagons and stay exactly as we are. Or we could be open oh, yeah, let's go. and say, come on in. Come on in. But that means you're going to have to receive somebody who's probably not just exactly like you. 
I wish I didn't have to preach this, you know. And I'm preaching it to me too. Because I think within all of us, there are those, there are those lines that have been drawn. But the gospel knows no such lines. Jesus does not know those, those lines. So we don't want our church to stay in the same little spot, the same pocket of people, the same number forever. We want to grow. And not just because we can say, oh, look, our church is growing, but for the glory of the kingdom of God. We want to enlarge the number of people that are going to heaven and not going into hell. Yeah. And every soul that is saved in this church or any other, any soul that is saved is one last person. One last person whose destiny is eternal torment. Yeah. Is that not a worthy mission to try to stop people from walking over that cliff into the abyss? Church, we've got to get busy. And because in order to grow, we have to accept people into companionship here who are maybe not just like us. Now, we all know churches that are primarily old churches. You go there and it's nearly all senior citizens. And we know churches too, don't we, that want to be exclusively young churches that don't respect older people. I want to have both. Amen? Amen. Let's not be an old church. Let's not be a young church. Let's be a church where anybody can worship. Amen. Where anybody can receive Jesus. I don't want to be a rich church or a poor church. <laughs> right? I don't want to be a white church or a black church. I want everybody to be able to receive Jesus right here. We need to be a church that loves the lost one so much we will leave the comfortable confines of our 99 strong flock and go after that one lost one regardless of who they are or if we have decided they are worthy or not. Amen. Did Jesus ever tell us to evaluate whether someone's worthy before we share the gospel with them? Him dying on the cross for them has already sealed the deal that they're worth something. Even if society has deemed them worthless, brethren, we got to be a friend to sinners. Yes. We've got to be able to reach into the darkness and pull people out. And if we want to minister to those who are lost, it's going to require getting out of our comfort zone from time to time. Now, these, these tax collectors, you may think, well, what's so bad about that? Yeah, I, I don't like taxes either. <laughs> but in those days, these tax collectors, they were considered traitors. They were turncoats. They robbed their own people. And that's how they made their living, was financially preying on other folks. They were absolutely hated by society. <clears throat> but they flocked to Jesus. People hated their guts, folks. And there's people in our world today that are hated, but Jesus doesn't hate them. Jesus doesn't hate them. I think about all the types of people that we see Jesus interact with in the Gospels. I see outcasts. People caught in sin publicly. Remember the woman who had been caught in adultery and they were ready to stone her when Jesus came on the scene and showed her mercy, right? There were those who were shunned for being diseased. The leper, that sort of thing, right? Former prostitutes were in his group. And even his disciples, you think about the 12 that he handpicked to follow him and spread the gospel. They were mostly unschooled ruffians. They were workers, laborers, fishermen. You even had Simon the Zealot in there. <laughs> Simon, now the zealot in those days, that was kind of an anti-government, let's, let's overthrow the government type of guy, you know. And later on in the gospel, you actually, you actually see uh, him, he, he, carried, he was one of the two disciples that carried a sword, him and Peter did. So this guy was armed and dangerous, right? And he was in Jesus, 12 disciples. And that's interesting to me because I, I've been glad over the years that my ministry tends to attract those kinds of folks. And I like that. I like that very, very much because I want to be able to share the gospel with people who maybe wouldn't accept it somewhere else. 
or, or wouldn't hear it from somebody else. I want to be able to reach out there and grab a hold of them. And when a, tr when a person with a truly rough lifestyle becomes a Christian, it can make religious people uncomfortable. You know, all of a sudden you have someone new in your church. And the, you know, the apple cart's a little, little upset, right? It's like, man, this person doesn't yet know that we talk this way and we dress this way and we act this way. Can we still love them? Can we still love them? Let's not turn anybody away, even if they don't come into the house all scrubbed up and ready to be super Christian. Now, and, and that's awful, isn't it? That people feel like they have to clean their act up before they come to Jesus. Yeah, you got you got to be so good to go to church, right? Are you, is this thing on? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Every one of us, every one of us could be counted as a sinner and as a hypocrite and all this other stuff. Folks, it'll make us uncomfortable from time to time who God brings to us. But that challenges us to get out of the, the ivory tower, to, to, to get out of our comfort zone and go after the type of people that Jesus would be after. Now, this is interesting to me. That in this chapter, 15, we have three parables in a row about seeking what is lost. Now, I want you, I want you to get this, because this blessed me quite a bit this week. The first story is about a shepherd leaving 99 sheep to go get the lost one. And of course, I think it's easy to see who that shepherd is. We've studied sheep and shepherds a lot in this church, Amen. <laughs> You're like, don't do it, Pastor. Don't preach on sheep again. Okay, I won't. <laughs> we finished that. But I think here it's clear to see that this shepherd represents Jesus. And that Jesus, of course, goes and he seeks out that straying sheep. And then he carries that sheep on his shoulder, which is an emblem, brethren, of how he's carried us. Amen. Because it's only on the shoulders of Jesus. It's only through the sacrifice of his mortal body that you and I could be forgiven for our sins. Amen. Yes. He carried us, brethren. And when you see him carrying that sheep, that's me on his shoulders, brethren. Oh, yeah. And he carried me out of darkness. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to consider. And then later on, I didn't read this one, but the, the parable of the prodigal son is here. And it's easy to see in that story, isn't it? That the father that welcomes the sinful son home represents our Heavenly Father, represents God the Father very, very much. And, and that father receives us when we were dead. Thank you, Jesus. Dead in our sins and trespasses. There's no two ways about it. Before you know Jesus, you're an enemy of God through your sins. But the Father welcomes you. How wonderful to know, isn't it, that God gives access to himself in that way. But I want to focus on the woman who seeks the coin. And I think it's easy to see the shepherd as Jesus, and it's easy to see that Father as God the Father, but when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, now surely this is the Holy Spirit, but I think there's more to this than may meet the eye. Look at it again in Luke 15, 8. It says, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she is found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. For I have found the coin that I have lost. And just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Brethren, I believe this woman, the woman who seeks the coin, I believe that's the image of the church. The church is called the bride of Christ and is almost always referred to as female. So when you read it with that interpretation, it takes on the same meaning, but a little bit, just a little shade different. Think about it. 
<laughs> what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? That verse right there tells you what a church ought to be doing. Think about it. We've got to recognize that there's a lost coin that we need to find. Now, we've got nine others, but we value that one lost stray coin. Amen? Amen. Because God values that one lost stray sheep, that one lost stray coin. That is God's perspective is that it is worth looking for the coin. That it is worth looking for the sheep. That people who are lost have value to God. Even if society has assigned no value to them whatsoever. And what are we supposed to do as a church? Well, if we're like this woman, brother, we're going to light a lamp. <laughs> Ooh, that's number one. See, we can't repel the darkness and find things in the darkness until we get lit up. So we can drive back the darkness. Amen. We, we the church have to be like this woman and say, all right, I've lost something, but, it, but it's beautiful and it has value and I'm going to go after it. But I'm going to need a little light first. So let me, let me crank up the lamp. How many of you know the church needs to, to shine? Amen. The church needs to be shining, beautiful, beacon, lighthouse of hope for the lost and for the hurting. Yeah. And that's on me and you. We've got to spend time with God. We've got to know the Lord. We've got to stoke that fire within until there's some light coming off of us. And then we're ready to do what? We're going to sweep the house and we're going to seek diligently until we find the coin. Brethren, think about it. We need to shine, but then we need to seek. Now, churches get the idea that we're just going to sit back and be good and God will bring folks to us and it's going to be wonderful. And that is true. That is true to an extent. God has brought a lot of new folks to us. I'm so happy for you. I'm glad every one of you is here. And I love and value you very, very much. I'm glad you are a part of this journey with us here at Cornerstone. Hallelujah. So we're going to light that lamp. We're going to make sure that we shine. But brethren, we are going to have to get out and seek somebody. Amen. God will bring some. But if we're, not, if we're not shining and seeking, we're not doing what the church ought to be doing fully. Amen. Yeah, thank you. We're not, we're not going to just wait on who God will bring. We're going to say, you know, I know that guy's lost. I know it's highly unlikely he will ever come through that door. So I'm going to seek him. Amen. Amen. I'm going to crank up my light and I'm going to go out here and I'm going to look. And I'm going to sweep under everything I've got because people are worth finding. Amen. People are worth saving. Amen. People are worth the effort, even when the world tries to convince you otherwise. All right. They're worth it. So we, the church, we gotta, we got to seek the sinner, not avoid the sinner, right? No. We can't become club men for Christians and say, boy, aren't we glad we all made it? <laughs> Oh, we're all so perfect, aren't we? Yeah. Ooh, you know, and that's when you're a Pharisee. That's when you're a Pharisee. You say, man, I've got it all figured out, and all them people out there are wrong. Come on. That is not the mission of the church. That is not the heart of Jesus. That is not the spreading of the gospel. But this is. Yeah, let's light the lamp, yeah. and let's seek them, brethren. Yeah. We're going to go out and find the lost. We're going to find the sinner. We're going to say, not only will I receive someone who's a sinner, I'm going to go get them. <laughs> I'm after them because I want to be in the soul winning business. The question is, are people worth anything to you? That's the question. Are people worth anything to you? And if they are, what are we doing if we're not sharing the gospel with them. <clears throat> what are we doing if we're not sharing the gospel with sinners? Are people worth anything to you? Now this lady, it says that one coin was worth so much to her. It sounds like she tore the house apart. You ever tear, tear the house apart looking for something? 
Every now and then, Carrie will get to looking for something, and I'll find her in a closet, you know, and stuff will just be flying out. I'll just back up. Just leave. Because she's in seek mode, right? I know it's here somewhere. I'm going to sweep the house. I'm going to tear the whole place down getting to this coin because I believe this coin has value. Isn't that wonderful? That God sees some value in us. So let's see the value in every person that comes to the doors, every person in our community, they're worth saving brethren, or Jesus wouldn't have died for them. Amen? Amen. But are people worth anything to you? That's, that's when you'll get on mission with God or not, it is how much people are worth to you. What's their value, right? Now, Jesus took criticism for associating with all of these lowly people. Where might we find Jesus today if he were here in the flesh, in his earthly ministry? Would he even be welcomed in some of our churches? you got to ask yourself, right? Remember, he had the appearance of a long-haired commoner, right? Would he show up today in a biker jacket? Would his jeans have holes in them? Would we take one look at him and say, that hippie isn't welcome here? Because he doesn't act and look like me. I hope we would. I'd say we're a sorry church if we acted like that. Let's never be guilty of that, Brother Brad. Exactly. Let's be the person who says, you know what? I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you've been into or up to. And I don't care who you associate with. You need to know Jesus. Amen. And I'm here to tell you about him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know I'm challenging some of you. I, you know, in, in coming to preach this today, I, I knew I knew I was going to get on some toes. And I don't do that to you too often. you got to admit. I, I try to challenge you, but there comes a time when I really feel in my spirit that God wants me to preach something, and this was the call. To remind you that Jesus died for everyone. He died for the 99, and he died for the one, didn't he? All are important to them. So God's people need to have the same vision. We need to not rank people. We want... The well-off and the well-behaved to come to church, sure. But what are we going to do when the rebel shows up? <laughs> See, that was me. That was me. Before I came to know Christ, I, whew, man, I lived a very, very rough life. And my good friend, who is still my best friend today, and his dad, Brother Oscar, whom some of you who have met, preached our revival last time, they did like this woman, man. They, they saw my lostness, and they didn't say, Man, don't ever let that, that weirdo, that, that sinner, that, that evil Marcus, don't ever let him in this church. Man, they lit the light and they came after me. They started praying for me, witnessing to me. It wasn't a couple weeks I got saved. I didn't know what was going on. I said, why am I in church? I, I don't know what to do, what to say. I've never read a stitch of the Bible. I have, what if they called me to pray? You know, I mean, I had all these millions and millions of questions. And I'm so thankful that that little church there didn't look at me and say, no, not you. Get out of here. We don't, we don't want you. If there's any doubt in your mind, church, we want everybody. Amen. Just in case there's any doubt in your mind, we want everyone to come to Jesus because that's what God wants. Second Peter tells us that it is not God's will that anyone should perish. But then all should come to repentance. Amen. That's all, brethren. And that's not exclusionary on anybody, is it? That's not our call to make. The gospel is to be shared with every person, all kinds, in every city, in every town, every race, every tribe, every tongue. That's who you see in heaven in Revelation. It says people of every kind will be there. Yeah. Every kind. Yeah. All praising the same God. Church, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what we must do. We must seek people like a shepherd. We must sweep the house and diligently search so that we can be a part of this great rejoicing we're told happens. Now, us preachers like to quote this, but it's really neat to see that the angels in heaven rejoice when even one sinner comes to repentance. Amen. Amen. That there's a party in heaven. I bet that place shakes, don't you? I'm talking to the angels. There's tens and tens of thousands and thousands upon thousands of them. 
And if they all go to shouting and jumping when somebody receives Christ, that is bound to be quite a sight. And I want to rejoice with them. You see, that's what the woman does. And that's what the church must do. It says when she found it, when she found the coin, it says she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. Rejoice with the church that went out and found a coin that had been lost. Rejoice with the church that lights up the lamp and seeks the lost. Be a part of the joy of seeing somebody come to know the Lord. That's what we ought to all be about, brethren. Mm -hmm. I tell you, when we, we've learned a lot about suffering from the book of Job. And we know that when one member suffers, they all suffer in this body. But brethren, when we rejoice, I'm hearing Brother Eric up here, and he, I'm telling you, he, I, I wanted to just give the altar call when he finished a while ago because he's telling you straight up that our God is mighty and he's able to deliver you and all of it is in his hands. And don't ever sell God short and don't ever doubt him and don't ever fall into the pattern of the world that says it's not going to be all right. You believe, brother, and now you're on the other side of it and I rejoice with you. I rejoice that this coin right here is shining and in the house today. Praise God. They says she calls her friends and neighbors says, did you hear? Somebody got saved this morning. Did you hear? We're going to be baptizing somebody. Man, that's the type of rejoicing that we want to do. The angels rejoice and we join them. Amen. And we'll do that a whole lot more if we'll learn to love all people no matter what they're like and who they are, and realize that the gospel is for all people. Amen to that. Amen. So don't ever let that voice of the Pharisees come back. Let it die with them. Let that nastiness, let that venom be buried in the past forever, like it needs to be. That no longer would there be anyone who says, don't you hang out with those ugly, nasty people. Don't you hang out with those low lives. Don't you hang out with those sinners? Let's put that to bed forever and say instead, I want to receive, as Jesus receives, sinful people. Amen. I will sit down and eat. I will have a feast with tax collectors. I, I will invite all of these people that society has forgotten, that society has rejected, the society has spat on, the society has stomped on and ground them into the powder. I want them all to come in and find out that there is a balm for the hurting that is inside of humanity. Whatever is hurting you, Jesus is the cure. Amen. Whatever is messed up on the inside of you, that is what Jesus died to redeem. That's what I want. And if you want that same thing, then we're going to be on mission together. And the good news is you light your lamp and I light mine and you light yours and you light yours. We can make a whole lot of light, can't we? Because <laughs> again, two are better than one. It's a threefold cord, brother, and we're friends together and we're all wrapped up in Jesus and you're not going to split us apart because we're going to be wrapped together and that cord's going to get stronger the more strands we bring into it. Even strands that aren't exactly the same type of cord as me. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's close with a song.